Uh, okay, so we are starting out today. Today is one problem. <laughs> Hopefully you got the handout. If you haven't, it's right up here. Um, I made plenty of them. Uh, there is one program we're going to look at today, and it is going to model, where did it go here? Uh, that's not it, that's not it, that's not it. It is modeling, ah, the ice cream shop. Okay, we're actually going to try something live in person demo with people to demonstrate threading. We have now opened up an ice cream shop. I'm sorry for people watching the video, you're going to, have, you're going to not see the chaos that's about to ensue. Um, okay, here's what I need. I need 11 volunteers or conscripts. Come on up. First, first three people get to be customers, which means you get ice cream if you actually, if I actually have real ice cream. All right. Uh, let's see. Okay, one, two, three. There we go. Okay. Other people, the next people, you get to be a clerk. We get to be a clerk, a clerk, a clerk, a clerk, a clerk. Somebody has to be the manager and somebody has to be the cashier, and I think well, that's it. I think, oh, here's a couple of clerks. If you, anybody else who's up here to clerk, there we go. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, clerks. Good deal. Clerks, go over in this corner over here. Okay, oh, and by the way, uh, everybody grab one of these too, which is your instruction manual. Okay, there should be enough for everybody. Okay, here's what we're doing. We're going to model an ice cream shop. Now, what we're actually doing is we're modeling a problem that was given on, a, believe it or not, a CS107 final exam from many years ago when multiprocessing and threading was in CS107. It used to be. We've changed things since then. Okay, but here's what we're doing, all right? We are setting it up. So where's our manager? Who's gonna be, okay? You're the manager. You're gonna be. You're gonna be. People are gonna fight over you, actually, as it turns out. Okay. And where's our cashier? You're gonna kind of come in near the end. Okay. But you have. There's a little number system here. So the one, two, three. They people will. The customers will take the number in order. So I've got numbers. We have ice cream cones. Okay. And we have lots of. Who are the customers? Customers over here. Okay. So here's the way this works, all right? We're modeling this with only three customers, okay? A customer does the following. A customer comes into our ice cream shop and says, I want uh, X number of cones. And you have how many cones you want on there, okay? So they're gonna come in and they're gonna say X number of cones. And what they're going to do is because they want to get their cones quickly, or at least as quickly as they can, they're going to grab a clerk. For some reason, we have as many clerks as ice cream cones that are going to be delivered that day. And each clerk gets to make one perfect ice cream cone. In fact, each clerk can try to make an ice cream cone perfect, but the manager is going to keep them honest if it turns out to be terrible. I used to have a friend who, he worked in an ice cream shop, and he and a buddy of his used to have a competition to see who could make the smallest scoop without somebody complaining. <laughs> Which is really a mean thing, <laughs> you know. Like you end up a tiny little scoop, you're like, oh, I'm just too nice not to complain, whatever. Anyway, um, you don't get to do that. You will actually have a more or less deterministic, it's a random thing, but it's deterministic as far as the ice cream cones go. Okay, so they will come in and they will grab a clerk. for the num They will grab the number of clerks for each ice cream cone, okay. Each clerk will then, actually we'll make the clerks walk all the way over to this table to grab an ice cream cone. This is going to be a time thing. There's going to be ice cream cones over there that you're going to make. When you may have made an ice cream cone, you're going to walk back and you're going to present it to the manager. Okay? And by the way, you are milling around at this point waiting for your ice cream cones. Are we getting in the way? Okay? You're not getting in the way. You're just kind of waiting for the ice cream cones. When you have created an ice cream cone that you think is perfect, in other words, you have grabbed one, <laughs> you're going to bring it back to the uh, to the uh, manager, and if there are two of you who are kind of going towards the manager at the same time, you get to fight over who gives it to the manager. Okay? Now, you don't really need to participate in this fight. Just okay. basically grab one. Sure, sure. And, uh, you know, whoever you want. It's your kind of choice in that case. Good. Okay? And then the manager, you are going to decide whether or not it's a good ice cream cone. Don't tell the clerks it's written on the back. B means bad, G means good. On the ice oh, cream cones. Okay. Don't tell the clerks this. Okay. So anyway, and then you are going to either tell them, yes, that was a beautiful ice cream cone, in which case you are going to say, now I have made one of my six ice cream cones that I have to make today. Okay. Okay? Once you have made it, and you might want to keep track. Like you can say, sure. I need to make six, and you can say five and four. Sounds Once good. you make all six that, is, that are good, or that you have approved, you get to go home for the day. Great. Okay? All right. Clerks, if the manager says, 
no, that wasn't a good cone. You have to throw that cone away, just throw it right on the floor wherever you want, go get another cone, and come back and fight again, okay? For the, for the manager's attention, okay? Customers, you're just waiting around. Now, if the, if the manager says, uh, this is a great cone, perfectly fine, you can go deliver it to the customer, and then you get to go home, okay? All right, and now, once you get all three of your cones back, you come take a number, okay? And the cashier is waiting for somebody to take care of, okay? Now, the minute you see somebody take a number, you can go, oh, I'll take number one. And then take as much time as you want checking them out, right? Make sure they pay you in the right, the right point, whatever you want, all right? But you have to check, just check them out. Once you check them out, you get to mark off that you have checked off one customer. You have to check off three customers, then you get to go home, okay? All right. And then uh, customers, when, you, when she's checked you out, you can then take your ice cream and go home. Okay, but at the end of the day, you should have however many ice cream cones you get. Now, does everybody, that was a lot of stuff all at once, okay? You have your own instructions here, okay? In fact, I will pull up the instructions so that everybody can kind of see what's going on. Let's see, how am I gonna do this? I'm gonna pull this up here, it should be here, and then ice cream. Details. There we go. And if this pulls up correctly, we should do that. And there we go. Hold on. Not now. And here are the instructions. I will make this as big as I can. And there we go. Okay. So I know there's a lot there, but you can kind of see what's happening, right? The customer grabs an ice cream cone, grabs a clerk for ice cream cone, mills around. The clerks do their thing. When the customer gets back the ice cream cones, they go to the cashier, take a number, etc. But to get what's going on more or less? I mean, it might look a little crazy. Let's see if we can make this happen without, maybe no, no real fights, please. Um, but you can, you can uh, see what happens. Okay, so customers, come on into the shop as much, as, whenever you want, okay? And, and go buy your business, okay? Clerks over there. All right, I will, I will narrate for the people listening on the video. Uh, we are getting the, the ice cream cone, Customers are asking the clerks, they're grabbing a clerk, a clerk is going over for the ice cream cone, clerk goes to the manager and says, is that a good cone? Yes, it is. It's a good cone, all right, so we got a good cone, you give it back there, okay, and then, now there's some people milling around, the, the, there's a little, oh, bad cone, we got a bad cone in there. Okay, so there's a good cone, okay. So you can see there might be a little bit of a bottleneck here. Right? <laughs> oh no, we got more bad cons. Okay, oh, bad cons. Okay, no, are you, is that a good con? That, that was a good con. Oh, okay, okay. That's good. Yeah. Okay. So, all right, so then the, has the cashier had anything to do yet? No, oh, one person, okay. And so you've gotten all your cones. Do you have just one cone? Yep. Just one cone, okay. All right, and so you get to take a number. Okay. That's a good cone, all right. And. Let's see, two, there's number two. Okay, so num one person is still waiting for the cones. And have you done all six cones? I've done all six okay, you can go home. Manager gets to go home for the day. Clerks, have you taken care of all your cones at this point? Yeah, you're gonna all go home. You're great, good to go. Now we have that, and you have now taken care. Okay, the cashier is the last one to go home, sadly, but, uh, but that's that. Okay, and we're all done, and you got your cones. Okay, now, that was a bit of a melee up here, right? No fights, I didn't see any real fights. But did you kind of see that this is the thing we're about to try to model, all of that madness in one program? Okay, that's what we're trying to, to model here. And you have the program, and there's a lot to it, but we, can, we will go through it one little part at a time. Okay, so questions on what happened up here? Did anybody see anything that was odd or didn't get or whatever? If you didn't quite figure out what was happening, that's okay, yes. Uh, Yeah, so okay, okay, well first, good, good question. The question was, look, I'm confused on like the mechanics of how this is gonna work, like programming-wise, like are they all getting it? So it was all happening kind of in parallel. Each customer was able to ask for however many cones by telling a clerk, one clerk at a time, please make me a cone. And that was what was happening. So one customer went to a clerk and said, make me a cone. And for some reason, we had a number of the clerks, one per cone which is a weird model. So I will grant you that this model of an ice cream store is a little bit weird and probably wouldn't work in real life, and you could certainly make it better. 
But that's the model. One person uh, who wants n number of cones goes to n number of clerks and says, make me one cone. And then they go and ask the manager. And the manager is saying, that good cone, bad cone. And the clerk has to keep making cones until they get a good cone. Emma, you probably made three cones or whatever before you got a good one or whatever, right? So uh, I saw Emma come back and forth a couple times and scowl on her face with the number of cones she was making. Uh, and then the cashier had to get the, now notice that the, the clerks were kind of fighting with each other for the manager's attention, fine. The customers were not fighting for the cashier's attention and you probably want it that way. <laughs> like if in, in a real ice cream store, you'd rather have the customers go when they get up to the line, go, oh, I'm next and then they get handled next. As far as the clerks and the, uh, and the, uh, the manager go, well, they could kind of all mill around until one gets to decide. Okay, do we see the kind of the basic idea though of this? Okay, now we're gonna try to model it using threading uh, techniques that we uh, hopefully kind of understand now, but we will go through them. Okay, we're actually gonna go through uh, five different types of things here with this program. It is kind of a meaty program. Um, I, I can't really imagine how it ended up as a one final exam problem, maybe it was two, but, um, but anyway. That's the way it goes. We're going to talk about a binary lock, which should be at this point, hey, do a mutex. This is going to be a binary lock. We're going to do a generalized counter. That should be thinking maybe semaphore. You should be thinking about that. A binary rendezvous. A binary rendezvous is when basically, well, we'll get to it, but it's two, two pro threads trying to coordinate between each other. Like, for instance, a clerk and a manager trying to make a decision like, hey, the, the clerk has to wait for the manager to, make, to tell, them whether the, tell them whether the cone's good or not, and the manager has to wait for the clerk to come over and so forth. So that's going to be uh, something we have to A generalized rendezvous is when you have like multiple uh, things at once happening. This could be with, uh, let's say, the, ice, the people who are asking for the ice cream cones have to wait for all their cones to be made. There's like a generalized, like I'm waiting for a bunch of things to happen kind of before I can do anything. And then layered construction is more or less, uh, it's more or less like how do you do this one thing on top of the other? We'll, we'll do that, okay? And we'll see how that, uh, that works. You certainly can go download the code. Uh, you have the multi-threading, the, all the code right in front of you. So if you're looking at one piece and you want to go back and go, hey, wait, how did that work with the other part? Feel free. And I know you haven't had a chance to really look through this, but we will go through it one thing at a time. Okay, so binary lock. What's the binary lock? It's a mutex, basically. Okay, and to remind you, a mutex does nothing else except allow two threads to try to get into some critical region. And it doesn't even have to be the same critical region. They just have to basically both be fighting over some resource, one of only one of which can do, can access that resource at a given time. Many times it's a global variable or some shared variable they both want to update and you want to do it what we call atomically, okay? Uh, and then, so again, it's all about single thread access. Okay, the generalized counter, this is where we talk, start talking about semaphores. Uh, this is where the counter itself, the semaphore itself can do a, uh, it can increment a variable atomically. In other words, no other, like only one thread can actually make it do its thing at once, do the, the incrementing or decrementing, okay? We talked last time about the various things we can do with a semaphore. If we have a uh, semaphore that has a count of zero, like no permits, it's basically just used as a signaling thing back and forth. Okay, so one thread can signal another thread which is waiting on that. It's not like there's a permit here. Just one thread goes on waiting around. So we will see those uh, used as we go as well. Okay, and, uh, and this is where you're coordinating some, some limited resource that has some number of things in it. Number of cones or one cone or you know, one, one sort of uh, number of things that we're going to, uh, that you might want to uh, limit. Okay, all right. A binary rendezvous. This is where, again, you use a semaphore. And this is for inter-thread communication. Okay? And uh, the example here is a pretty good one. So suppose we had thread A that needs to know when thread B finishes something. Okay? So for instance, when the manager has to determine whether or not the cone is well, good or not, the clerk has to wait around for, uh, for that to happen and has to wait on that other thread to do uh, to do their, their thing. 
Okay? What we can do is we can have this rendezvous semaphore initialized to zero because all we care about is the signaling part. Okay? And thread uh, A actually waits on that semaphore. Okay? And after thread B finishes, it signals thread A, which continues. Okay? And thread B does not care about anything else that the, the other thread is doing at that point. It just goes, uh, goes signals and then moves on. Okay? So that's how a binary semaphore works, or, a, or rather a, a binary rendezvous in this case. Okay? Uh, there's only one event that needs to happen, and uh, that's all we care about. Okay? This is sometimes used to wake up other threads, like a thread's just waiting around and then somebody wakes it up with this signal. That's a, a good way of, of thinking about it. Um, you can do a bi-directional rendezvous. This is different than a generalized one. This is like basically one thread waits for the other, which waits for the other. You have to be very careful that you do that so that they're not both waiting at the same time because then you'll get deadlock. So you have to be careful there. Okay, so there's, a, there's, there's some logic that you need to, to figure out there. Okay. All right, uh, a generalized rendezvous is where you have a binary rendezvous and a generalized counter, okay? This could be more or less the, uh, the like ice cream customers are waiting for the clerk to do something. They're actually waiting for a bunch of clerks to do something and they have to, uh, to sit around. So in this case, thread A spawned five thread Bs. Ah, that sounds like the ice cream uh, customer asking five different clerks, okay? Thread A spawned five thread Bs and needs to wait for all of them to make a certain amount of progress before advancing, that's when we would use this, this technique. Okay? Again, you have uh, the semaphore initialized to zero. When A needs to sync up with the other ones, they, um, it will block until they all finish. Okay? And then when they all finish, then uh, they will, uh, the, the thread A will then be able to get move forward after that. Okay. This is a good, this is the generalized part of this is you have some task that you're dividing up. You're saying I need to make three cones, I'm dividing it into three different clerks. You need to uh, generalize that and then wait for all of those tasks to complete. That's the generalized uh, rendezvous. Okay. All right. And then uh, this whole layered construction is basically using all this together to say, oh, we've got a mutex, and then we can, we can have a semaphore that uses the mutex, and how do you kind of piece them together? You've got some global counter that uses this, uh, uh, that's going to have a mutex associated with it. You've got to wait around when it says the counter changes value or reaches some value and, and so forth. So that's the, the big uh, takeaway for that one, is that you need, to, you need to be able to use these constructs together to suit, your, to suit whatever you're trying to do. Okay, all right. Let us look at some of the actual code. Okay, I've already we've already talked about this. We modeled it pretty distinctly. Okay, ice cream store, clerks, manager, customers, cashier, lots of clerks, one manager, one cashier. Customers are in a hurry, so they get lots of clerks per one per ice cream cone. Uh, and then uh, once they get their cones back, they go to the cashier. I mean, it's not a terrible model, all things considered. And then each clerk just gets to make one cone. Yeah, that's a little weird but that's the way it works in this, uh, in this world. And the manager has to determine whether or not the cone is legitimate or not. Okay? And the big issue there the, for the cashier is it has to be a first in, first out queue, otherwise it's chaos. Because the customers go, oh, yeah, I was here first, and why didn't you take care of me, and so forth, and Brenda would not want to deal with that, but she could have helped it. Okay? And then uh, we actually have to, at some point, determine when everybody goes home. It's a little wonky. Like that the manager knows the manager has to make six cones by the end of the day, that's a little weird. So we could have done it some other way, but in this case we just say, right off the bat we'll do that. You will see how the code ends up manifesting itself for that. Okay? All right. Questions before we start looking at the code about the overall picture here? You've seen it, you now we're gonna see some code, you kinda get the idea? Okay, good. All right. So here's the various things we're gonna look at. Okay, we're going to look at uh, all these different parts of the code. You have them in here. I'll try to tell you which page these are on as we go through them, because um, they're not necessarily in the order on the code, in the code. Um, but the first thing we're going to look at is the random number generation, just to kind of see where it is. This is actually on page four of nine in the handout, okay, and I've got it right here as well. 
Basically, we have lots of randomness going on here. Why? Because we want to make it look like it's some sort of like actual time constraints, and it's not always the same time. Okay, we do this often with these sorts of things. This makes debugging a little harder because it is kind of random, but it will definitely test lots of different categories. Okay, most of these are times. We have um, get number of or, or get actually a couple of them are get number of cones. Like the customer comes in and says, "I want you know however many cones." So that's not a time. There's get browser browse time, which is the customer milling around. There is or and and that's part of it. There's get prep time. That's how long it takes the uh, clerks to make an ice cream cone that may or may not be good. And then uh, there's get inspection time, how long manager takes. And then finally there's get inspection outcome, which is the binary yay or, yay or nay as far as the cone goes. Okay? Relatively straightforward, not anything that you need to particularly current concern yourself about. Um, it's just using a library function we actually wrote to get these values out. Not a big deal. Okay, let's look at the structs here. So this model is uh, if you're in 106B this, or 106A, you would probably cringe if you saw this, that there's some global struct here. <laughs> All right? Why? Because we don't necessarily like global things. But with threads, sometimes it just makes it easier to pass around a global variable or to have a global variable than to deal with having a, uh, having a, a struct that you're passing around. Sure, for encapsulation reasons, we probably would want to pass it around in a, in a more robust program. But for now, we are just making a struct called inspection, and it's got these fields in it. Okay, It's got a mutex for available. This is the handshake, basically, between, it's the, it's the binary rendezvous between the clerk and the manager. Okay, So there's an available mutex, which is basically saying only one clerk can be dealing with the manager at a time. The manager can only look at one ice cream cone at a time. That's the mutex. Okay. There is a semaphore for signaling, hey, uh, manager, I've got an ice cream cone for you. And there's a semaphore for saying, hey, clerk, here's your ice cream cone. It's terrible or it's great. Right? That's another one. And then there's actually a Boolean in here for whether or not it passed. And then, by the way, out here, we create a struct called inspection, and then we immediately declare it as a variable inspection. Seems like it's overloading the name, but that's the way it goes. So this is a global variable. Again, we didn't have to do it globally, but just makes it a little easier. Now, uh, there are a couple interesting things about this. If there's only one value about past or not, right? how many things can be using this struct at any one time? One thing, right? One manager or one uh, one manager or one clerk can be inspecting this or using it at one time. There's only one manager, which is nice. Uh, in fact, if we did do many managers, like let's say we had multiple managers or assistant managers or whatever, then we would have to rethink this. We might have to have some other either a, array of these uh, inspection structs or something else because the way it works right now, there's one value at one time which says whether or not ice cream cone is good or not. That's it. Okay. All right, so that's how the struct works. Um, what questions do you have about that struct at this point? Maybe you don't. We'll see it in action very soon. OK, there's another struct, which is the checkout one. So we're kind of jumping ahead to the checkout phase. But the checkout uh, has a semaphore for uh, next in place in line, OK, which is a, a new kind of integer here. It's an atomic unsigned int. What that means is that that variable can be updated by multiple threads at the same time, and it will never do that weird double or not, not double counting. It is atomic such that it makes it so the plus plus works. No matter if 10 threads come at it once, it's, it's what we call thread safe. 10 threads can go update that, and it will always get 10 increments if 10 threads updated or up, up, uh, do or not. Yes? Is there ever a time we use an atomic Ah, good question. The question was, hey, is there ever a time we don't want to use the atomic variable? Um, most of the time we don't, because most of the time we're not using threads, right? And the atomic uh, operation is slower, all right, because it's got to do other some other things in there and it actually needs the hardware to support it so it's a different instruction and there's other hardware support which means it takes a little longer and if you know anything about C and C++ the bottom line is 
let the user do things as fast as necessary, but give them the tools to be able to do it correctly if that has to be an issue. So this is one of those ones where only use an atomic one where you're going to need it. Right? Otherwise, um, use the faster ones because most of the time you don't. Very good question. All right. Yes? So is the other way we talked about like updating a variable faster, is that right? The, if you just had a regular unsigned int here and you did plus plus, it's going to be faster than plus plusing this one because this one has some more like... like is there a reason okay. you didn't have like just like permanent injection? Oh, oh, right, right. Well, sure. You know, the last time we could have used a... We could, maybe we could have done this with an another semaphore. We could have done it... Some, uh, it would have been a little weird, but you would have, maybe you would have used a conditional variable, any or whatever. But in this case, we're going to see where, where it gets incremented or decremented, and then you'll go, oh, okay, it makes sense that we just, if we have this atomic thing, we might as well use it. You'll, you'll, we'll get there. We'll ask the question when we see it in action, when you see somebody doing something with next place in line. Okay. All right, good. So that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the couple of the structs that we're going to have. Again, global struct, okay? And uh, that's it. Now, the other one, again, at this point, it's a global. Um, it may be that multiple types of, uh, multiple threads are actually accessing it at the same time. It turns out it's OK, but the cashier is still going to take the customers in order based on this array here when they end up in the array. OK? And, and Maybe you'll understand that once you, if you can update this next place in line atomically, then you can use that as the actual, uh, as the actual index into the array and make sure that each customer gets their own spot in the array. You'll see that, uh, see that happening as well. Okay. The waiting customer semaphore uh, informs the cashier their customer's waiting. So the cashier is going to go start up and then go, I'm waiting for customers to finish, and then just wait. And then eventually a customer will signal the cashier, hey, I'm ready to get checked out. Let me check out. Okay. There are other ways of doing this. This just happens to be one of them. Okay. All right. Let's move on to the next uh, thing. All right. Here's the first real like major function here. This is the customer function. The customer function is on page, uh, I think it's near the end, actually. Yeah, page 9 of 9 right near the end, right before main. It's the customer one. Okay. All right. So what does the customer have to do? Well, the customer goes and, and figures out, uh, the customer already knows by the time they get here how many cones they want. We will do that. We will initialize that in main, as it turns out. And the customer will then create a vector of clerks. Okay. It could have created an array of clerks of the number it's going to do. It doesn't matter. In this case, we're just making a vector. We're in C++, we can do vectors, okay? And then it is going to call thread on the clerk function with its, uh, with its variable i, which is just the, uh, it's not really the id in this case. The id will be passed in based on, because uh, we've got two things going on here. We've got the number of the cone, which is i, and the id of the customer as well. Okay, that's going to get passed into the clerk. So the clerk is, needs to know who to go back to anyway. And so the customer is going to ask a particular clerk, say, hey, my ID is such and such. I want, uh, I am, this is cone whatever. Okay. All right. And then, uh, and then the customer goes and browses, which uh, just is some time, takes up some time. Okay. And then the customer has to do what? The customer has to wait before the customer checks out all of the customer's cones need to be made. Fair enough? Which means that you're gonna, they're going to actually join on all of their clerks, and they're going to wait around until the clerks uh, are done making their cones. Now, they might still be browsing and all the clerks end, but either way, that's gonna, at this, by the time you get past this line on line 8 here, you are going to, the, the customer knows that all of the cones have been made. Question? Yeah. Yes, good question. The, the, the join here simply blocks until the threads are done. And that's the whole point of join. And it cleans up the thread because they're done as well. Okay. So at this point, we know going forward, we can, the customer can check out because all of the clerks have 
uh, finished their cone making. Okay. Now, there's no like, hey, here's your cone business. I mean, it's all that would all have to happen some other. We didn't make that into this thing, but um, the, you can assume that if we were really doing this and there was something else here, we would actually have a cone handover sort of thing. But in this case, clerks just know, or the customer knows, I have my three cones now. Maybe they're waiting at the cashier. Who knows? Right. Okay. All right. Then the uh, then the uh, customer has to go and. Uh, actually find the next place in line. Now, take a look at this line. This is where your question might come in. Check out next place in line plus plus. Okay? This is going to assign whatever next place in line is to this customer and then atomically increment that variable. Okay? What this means is that if two threads are coming in at this, if two customers are coming in at the same time, boom, one of them will get the next place in line. The other one will get the following place in line, guaranteed. Okay, there is no race condition here specifically because we used an atomic variable there. Otherwise, we could have a mutex on there and then lock it and then update the place in line and then unlock it. This makes it a little easier. If we've got this atomic uh, integer, we might as well use it. This kind of negates the necessity of a lock in this case. Yeah. Yeah, 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 good question. So what are the cases where you do need a mutex? There aren't that many atomic operations. <laughs> increment happens to be one where we can, or, or an integer that gets incremented and decremented happens to be one where we can change it atomically. Um, I think you could also add something to it or subtract and multiply, whatever. Whatever you want, you can do math on that one and it's going to do it atomically. Um, but there, if it was a map, well, there's no atomic map necessarily, so still have the lock and unlock. It just makes it a little simpler, but you simply, certainly could do this with a lock and unlock if you wanted to. Yes? Uh, do you want to know how it's doing it atomically? Yeah, so it's, it's a bit beyond the scope of this class as far as what's happening, but there are machine instructions which when you call them will do this operation atomically and you just have to set it up such that this uses that, like use, uses the, that operation. It may just be, honestly, it may be that that class just puts a lock around it. <laughs> it might just be as easy as that. I, don't, I haven't looked it up, but I think in, in other cases it's... Uh, there, there are machine instructions which will speed things along, so that's why you might want to use this. Steven? Uh, so possibly if you lock and unlock when you alter internal variables, can't you use the Yeah, so the question was, hey, look, in processes we block and unblock if multiple processes can, uh, and can change one. It's not really a global variable because it, it could be the, calling a signal handler because, remember, processes don't share memory. Um, but the, uh, in this case, yes, you, if you're using the atomic variable, you don't need the lock if that's all you're really doing to it is updating the variable itself. You don't need to worry about it because it will be done in such a way that you don't need to do the lock on it. Yeah. It's just another thing to show you. You can use this if it's, if it's a case where you have something like this. Don't overuse it because it is a little slower, but use it when you can if you want to. Or you can just lock. Nobody's going to take off points for that if, it's, if you do both or do the, one or the other. Okay, so then what happens after the customer uh, gets in line? Well, the customer tells the checkout, signals the checkout person to, or the cashier, to actually keep going. So the checkout waiting customer signals, so the cashier is going, I'm waiting around, waiting around, and goes, oh, there's a signal, let's start processing this, uh, the uh, next customer. And the checkout, the cashier will go and look up who the next customer is based on the same variable. Okay, you'll see how that works uh, as well when we get to the cashier. Okay? And while the cashier is checking the customer out, the customer has to wait. Okay, so the customer uh, says, uh, check out customer's place, wait, and remember this is a semaphore per uh, each one of those, or rather a, well, it looks like, hold on. It is what? It is a yeah, semaphore per customer in that case. Okay. And let's see, the semaphore, again, it's a, uh, let's see, semaphore customer, it's just a single zero value semaphore, just signaling. Doesn't need any like permits or anything like that. Could you have done this with permits? Maybe. Like with permits, the thing about permits though is that there's still a bit of a uh, race condition there as far as, um, who gets handled next with a permit? 
Like there might be some permit thing. If you signal everybody, it won't go necessarily in line. That's going to be an issue. Okay, we need the customers based on our model to be handled in the order they arrived at the cashier. That's the important part. Okay, all right. Once the signal comes back from the cashier, the customer has checked out and leaves. Okay, question. There are, okay, this weight right here. You tell me what that's weight. What did the customer, what did the customer just do? The customer just signaled the cashier. So what's the customer have to do? Wait for the cashier to check them out. That's what's happening here. Okay, so there's a double signal going on here. They're signaling the cashier to say, hey, can you check me out? And then waiting for the cashier to signal back. Now, the cashier has to signal back in the proper order. Right? The cashier, because this, this uh, signal, there is no waiting associated with a signal. Like you signal and then you go on. So it might be that all the customers are sitting here waiting. The cashier needs to go to signal the correct next customer. And we'll get to see how that works in a little bit. Okay? Question? The cashier will signal you in order. Cashier will signal in order. We'll see how that happens. Right, so your second part. So basically the question was, wait, if the, could, the, could somebody in line not have their, or have their cones made before somebody further up in line? Remember, the, the customer's just milling around until they get all their cones back, then they get in line. All right, this isn't a case where like, you go stand in line while your buddy goes and gets the, you know, whatever. It's, it's you know, you're one person stand, you only stand in line when you get your cones. So that's the order you'll be taking. Well, and now, it could be, certainly, that two customers get their cones at the same time and then fight over who gets to be in place first. That's fine, but whoever ends up in first place gets handled by the cashier first. And we'll see how that happens in a, in a minute or two. Other questions on this one? Yes, go ahead. So just to make clear, it, this looks a little weird, but so um, the whole checkout.customer place, that's because you literally have an array of semaphores, one for each customer, or is it one semaphore that's keeping track of all of No, no, let's take a look. There is a customer's array, which is a semaphore per customer, okay. right? So each customer gets their own semaphore, which they're waiting on. How do they know which, which, where they are in line? They do right here, they get their place in line by getting the next place in line variable, which is updated per customer that comes in, and then incrementing it so the next customer gets the next place in line. Okay. That's what they're doing right there. So then the cashier's just going to like and the, four loops through it. Yep, customer. cashier's just going to go through a loop and go you, 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 and know which one to actually get next. Okay. Right. And the only way the cashier is going to know to get anybody is because the cashier gets signal. So that's the, the uh, signaling part there. Okay. Is this starting to gel a little bit, how this stuff works? Good. Okay. If it's if you're like, oh, I get it all and I'm bored. Awesome. I would love it if that was the case. Right. <laughs> so great. If that's uh, if that's what's going through your head. Okay. Um, how does the customer browse? Pretty straightforward. The customer just gets a browse time and then sleeps for that amount of browse time. All right. The sleep for is the way threads sleep for a particular amount of time. They call it sleep for and then the amount of time in uh, micro or milliseconds. And then they do that. And then the customer uh, just uh, said, the customer just killed so many seconds. Okay. All right. That's that. All right. Let's look at the clerk function. OK, remember, one, oh, by the way, what happened? We, did, we kind of went right over this part. Here is where the clerk threads get started. This is back in the, in the customer function. This is an interesting point. We are going to see when we get to main that both the manager and the customers and the cashier are all created in main. And then the cashier and the manager immediately go to sleep, basically, because they don't have anything to do yet, but have their threads started. Yes, their threads have started, which means that it's actually less time to wake them up. 
This is going to actually follow directly into the next thing, in fact, not this next assignment, which I'll have out by tonight at some point, uh, or the, and then by the next assignment, you'll learn about these things called thread pools, which are ready, waiting threads to go do their thing. Does that sound like any other assignment you've seen? Farm, maybe? Right? Farm was processes waiting to go. They're already ready. They're what we call spun up, ready to go. That's the same sort of thing. We are spinning up the customers, the manager, and the, uh, and the cashier, but we are not spinning up the clerks until the customer actually does that. So it's kind of like the customer goes and like hires a clerk. Right? You can think of it that way, which would be weird. But. Okay. Now, we go into the clerk and we see what happens with the clerk. So the clerk, all right, uh, the clerk needs to do what? Make a cone that's perfect, and if it's not perfect, then it needs to make another cone until the manager says, you have made a perfect cone. Okay, so there's a little while loop in here that says while not success. This success is a local variable, does not need to be locked or anything, it's for the clerk itself, and that's the way it goes which is kind of nice. Every clerk has its own success variable. No need to block on, on that or have any, any reason to, uh, to lock on those. Okay. What does the clerk do? The clerk makes a cone. Okay. The clerk uh, locks the available lock. Okay. The available lock is whether or not the manager is available. Okay, so the, the clerk says, oh, I need to lock this manager lock. What happens if, some, if a thread tries to lock and somebody else holds the lock? Just blocks. Okay, so all the clerks could come and that's where they're fighting over the, uh, they're fighting over the manager, right? One of the managers looking at a cone and then says, the manager unlocks available and then goes, or the, I should say the other, uh, the other clerk that holds this lock unlocks it and then the manager's a free-for-all. All the other clerks try to grab that manager right there. Okay. All right. Then uh, the once the lock is gathered, then the uh, is obtained. The clerk says, "Oh, I'm going to signal the manager. Hey, go please inspect my cone." Okay. And then what does it do? It waits. This looks exactly like what it did before. The first you signal, then you wait because you're you're telling the other thread do something, and now I'm going to wait for you to finish it. Question, Hassan. Uh, so request, uh, the requested and finished parts of the inspection step are both semaphores? They are both semaphores with zero uh, permits. Like it's, a, it's, just a, it's just a signaling semaphore in that case. Yeah? The finished one, or the, the requested, is requesting the, uh, the manager. And by the way, what do you think the manager is doing at this point? If the manager is waiting for the requested signal, it is waiting. Right? So that's what it's doing right there. And then the manager has to then signal back to the thread, oh, now you can go again. Okay. All right. So there's only one, there's only one requested and one finished. What does that mean again about how many things can be dealing with this struct at one time? It turns out, actually, it turns out there's two, the, the manager and the uh, and the clerk, but no other clerks because they're both, they're all going to be stuck on this lock before they could go and change anything. That's why we're, that's why there's only one need for a zero uh, one there. Yeah? So there's like always one waiting, one sleeping, one doing something, and signaling back. There could be always one waiting and always one like, yeah, and then the manager signals and then it goes, it, maybe, maybe not, depending on how much time these things take. The manager could be sleeping, which means the manager's going to just wait until it gets a signal. Right? Or it could happen immediately. I mean, the nice thing, here's the nice thing about all of this. The way we set this up, as long as things are progressing okay, it's as efficient as it can be. There may be some wait time, but that wait time is out of our control. We're going to make it as efficient as possible so there's no extra wait time. And there's certainly no busy waiting here. We're not spinning, we're not doing any process, we're just kind of going, look, I know I'm waiting for some other thread. I'm just going to sleep until it happens. The instant it happens, I move on. That's the way it goes. Yeah, very good question. Why couldn't we signal on requested and wait on requested? 
I was thinking about this. I think there's a race condition there. If you signal and then try to wait, you might actually be the one getting your own signal if everything if things happen in an order where you don't uh, you, you in an or it could happen in an order where you send a signal, go to sleep and wait, and then by the time that signal propagates through the operating system, it comes back to you instead of the instead of the other thing waiting. And not only that, there's um, the semaphore would drop down again, and then it would take two signals actually. So that's probably the even better one. It would take two signals to actually un uh, to make one of them go, unless it happened to be exactly ordered. So you want to just avoid that kind of ordering nightmare. In this case, just use two because you know that one thread is going to wait on the request and the other is going to wait on finished and you're okay. <coughs> you can try it. In fact, go try to build it with one and see if, it, if you can get it to do a deadlock or not. But I imagine you might be able to. Yeah. Good questions. All right. Anything else on the clerk, what the clerk's doing? Oh, by the way, the clerk does what here? The clerk says, uh, waits for the manager to come back. And then the clerk checks success and says, oh, uh, either it passed or not, right? And if it didn't pass, well, first of all, it unlocks. And if it didn't pass, well, it makes another cone, <laughs> right? Otherwise, it would leave if it didn't do that. And so it may, it may stay in this loop for as long as it keeps making bad cones. It's just going to stay in that loop. Huh? Really understand what's going on there? Okay, good. All right. All right, the make cone, pretty straightforward. It's just going to wait again. It's going to like say, I'm about to make a cone, and it's going to get some time, and then sleep for that amount of time, and then uh, tell how much time it was. I'm going to run this program at the end. It, it scrolls through the screen, and it's like, oh my gosh, what's going on? But you'll see uh, when it happens. OK. All right, let's look at the manager function. So uh, the manager, remember, the manager starts out knowing how many cones it's going to make that day. It's a little weird. We could have done something else where there's a Boolean flag that says all cones, like all customers have been handled, signal the Boolean, you know, or not even signal, just, just you could have another signal if you wanted to. Or you could just say, the uh, yeah, signal would probably work pretty well. Have another semaphore for being done for the manager. It says, go home, you're done. And maybe you could link it together with a uh, one for the, uh, for the cashier as well, or something like that. Although the manager can actually go home although not the best business practice, before the cashier does. Because the cashier might still be taking care of uh, uh, all the other customers. But that's what it does. So it uh, needs to, so it knows how many cones it needs to make. The manager knows how many cones they need to make. And then they are going to attempt a bunch. We're just doing this to log it, as it turns out. And then they're going to approve uh, a bunch of cones as well. Until they approve the total number of cones they need to, they can't leave. They are going to, first things first, well, find out if they can leave, which they can't immediately. And then they're going to wait on requested because they're waiting for a clerk to come and hand them an ice cream cone and say, please investigate there. Please inspect this. All right. Then they inspect the cone. Just again, it's just going to be some time. And it's going to be some time. And it's going to actually update the, uh, in, update the struct to say whether or not the cone passed. And then after it inspects it, it's going to send a signal back to the waiting clerk to say, go check your cone. I just inspected it. All right? And then it does the uh, num cones attempted plus plus. Okay? And if inspection passed, it's going to say the number approved. Now, the, can the, this is going to happen at the same time as possibly the clerk is looking at inspection pass. Is that OK if they both look at the same variable at the same time? That's actually OK. As long as no thread is able to update while the other thread is looking at it, many threads can look at that one uh, variable at the same time because it's not going to change. So that's perfectly fine. They might do it in some weird ordering with the assembly language, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay. All right. So what do they do after that? So what's the, uh, what's the uh, manager do after they inspect a cone? They check the number of cones. They update the number of cones approved, possibly. And then they go back into the while loop. If they have reached the number of cones they need, exit the while loop, go home for the day. That's that. Question? I may have missed this, but it's the lock that unlocks that other cone function. Say again? Um, the lock that the other cone function only unlocks that other, you know, the manager check. So here we're saying that it's possible for a clerk and a manager to be simultaneously. Oh, 
such a good question. Okay, yes. So uh, he's saying, look, the lock happening, oops, the lock happening here, uh, is this the one here? Yeah. yeah, so the lock happening right here. Okay, you just have to remember that a lock has no care about what data structures there are. It doesn't know, it's not, it's not saying you can't touch this data structure. It's saying anyone else who tries to get this lock is going to be denied. Right? That's all it's doing. It's not, it's not like packaging up a data structure and saying, nope, nobody else can touch it. It's just saying, hey, if you're going to try to get my lock, you're not going to be able to. So it's very abstract in that case. Right? It's just saying nobody goes past this line until the lock is unlocked. That's the end of the story there. Okay? All right. Good question. Does that answer it for you there? It doesn't, doesn't affect the actual... Uh, so it doesn't... The, the, manager can go and do whatever it wants with that data structure at that point because it doesn't need to lock. Now, if, it was, if, if two threads were trying to update that data structure, then you would need a lock and then only one would be able to do it based on your logic around locking. So if I don't call lock and manager but try to modify it, then it doesn't go? No, you will get a, no, if it tried to, man, if, very good question. If the manager tried to update something, in fact it does, it actually updates the, uh, it actually updates the, in inspect comb, we'll see that in a minute, it updates the uh, Boolean about whether or not it passed or not. Perfectly able to do that. The child, or the, not the child, the uh, clerk is not going to look at that until after it gets its signal, which in well, that case it will be fine. Everything will be updated and it will be fine. Good. All right. Other questions on this? Sounds like you guys are starting to get this. This is great. Okay. All right. Let's now, let's see. Um, why can there only be one waiting clerk? Because of that lock. Right? That's the whole point of this, uh, that lock before. All the clerks will get there and go, oh, I can't do anything yet. Okay. So let's look at the, uh, this is the inspect cone. This is not too uh, interesting, except so basically, uh, sleeps for a while while it's inspecting the cone and then updating inspection passed based on whatever the random number that comes back from get inspection outcome is and then it uh, reports on whether it's approved or not and then ends. That's all the inspect cone does. But again, it does update the inspection passed very, uh, struct, but that's perfectly fine because no, we know logically that no other thread is even looking at that right now. Okay. What it can't do, by the way, is you can't go to the customer, like the customer can't, what if the clerk went and said, oh, I didn't get this to pass, I'm gonna give it back to the customer anyway, even though it's not a good inspection. It's not like the customer can go check this, because the customer should not have access to this because it's not, it's just between the, the manager and the clerk. I might be stretching the analogy a bit, but that's the way that, that you wouldn't want the clerk, you wouldn't want the customer to have access to this because this number is going to change for every inspection passed is going to change for every cone that comes through, and it's only one value, and it's not like it's stored anywhere except after the or except while the customer and the manager or the clerk and the manager care, then it's updated again for the next one that comes through, single struct in this case. Okay. Why are there no locks needed here? Because we've already locked what we need to. We logically know the only update is going to happen from the uh, right here, and the and the clerk is not reading this value at all right now. We know that based on our logic, and that's sometimes the hardest thing to remember to solve to figure out. Other questions on this one? Okay. All right. Now we're finally to the cashier. Okay. So again, the cashier knows how many customers there will be during the day. Um, a little weird uh, in that sense. We could have, again, done something where we had a queue that kept, or this uh, vector or a queue, probably a queue, of um, that, that eventually the cashier would uh, get a signal that says there's no more people that are going to enter the queue. And then when the queue is empty, the cashier can go home. We didn't do it quite this way. Remember, it's a final exam problem. It's not like, you can, not like this was an assignment problem. But, uh, but that's that. The cashier, now this is where it starts to get interesting for the cashier. Okay, the cashier does go in order, right? The cashier goes from zero to the number of customers, okay? And the, cust the first thing the cashier does is wait on the, uh, the waiting customer semaphore. In other words, if nobody's there yet, don't do anything but just sit there and wait, okay? Wait for that uh, thing. Could you have maybe done it where they wait on the 
first one, and then the a signal comes in, maybe. That might have been another, another way of doing it. But in this case, we just have that semaphore. It says waiting on semaphore. Then what does it do? Okay, It rings up uh, the customer I because anytime it's, when it gets that first signal, it knows that signal had to have, the first one anyway, has to come from that first, uh, from that first uh, customer. Okay, And so it brings up the customer. And then what does it do? Well, it knows that that was the customer it just rang up. So it signals that particular customer through that customer semaphore to say, you're done. I've checked you out. Go eat your ice cream. Okay, And then it goes and does the next one. Now, what could happen in the meantime? If another customer has come in and is waiting in the queue, well, this wait right here, this wait right here will blast right through. It'll blast right through that. Because another customer has already signaled, and this is a different. This is a difference between semaphores and signaling in, um, like a uh, signaling in processes. The signal, remember, does what? It's on a semaphore. It just decrements or increments a counter. So there's some counter there that has been uh, in the in case of the signaling has incremented that counter. And so by the time this wait happens, if another customer is already there, right through and handle the next customer immediately. Okay. That's an important part right there. Okay, And then uh, it signals that customer, goes to the next customer. Might have to wait if the customer's not ready yet. Uh, if the customer is ready, then, um, then it will just go, the, this will go right up and ring up the next customer. But it's doing it in order. And that's the, that's the important part here because this is kind of a queued up sort of system. Okay. Once all it goes through all the customers it needs to, goes home. Question. How is it in order of how the customers arrive? Is it just within the queue in that Yeah, good question. How is it that it's doing it in order of the customer? It's not when the order, sorry, it's not when they arrive, it's when they arrive to check out. In other words, the customer has gotten her ice cream cones and then she goes up to the cashier or goes up to the line, which may have other customers in it and stands there. At that point, let's go back quickly and look at what the customer, uh, what the Let's see, this is what the customer was doing. Here's where the customer is doing this. Remember, the customer gets their place in line by checking the next place in line variable, and then that's the, line, that's the signal it will end up waiting for, right? Because it actually, remember, here's where it does it. It waits in its place in line. And so the only way it can get in line is to go and get the next place in line and then update the counter so the next person in line gets the next place. It's kind of like taking that little bar at the supermarket and moving it behind your groceries. Like, you know, the next person's gonna be behind that, right? And that's what you're doing. You're like, oh, here's my place, and then I'm gonna put the bar behind the next one. That's kind of what's going on with that, that update right here. Okay. Other questions on that? Good, let's go back and look at Let's see, we did the manager, spec con, cashier. Okay, so the cashier, yeah, cashier is done when they checked every out in order. Yeah. Okay, you got, you got it. What was it? Is this something interesting? No, it was exactly what she was talking about. Oh, okay. How does it know to wait in order? Yeah, the customer gets the ordering. Because mm -hmm. we're Yeah, so it's, it, it, is, it is, yeah, this is, I mean, this is an interesting way of doing this. This function has no real idea how many, like, which customer is where, except for the fact that it's going through this loop. And the only reason it gets through the loop is because it first has to wait for that semaphore for the waiting semaphore, which is, are there any customers, is really what it is. And then uh, as a customer comes through, the customer, uh, when that signal happens, that gets decremented again. But if another customer comes in, it gets incremented. And so if two customers come in, it will be high enough that you know there's two people in line. And then uh, that will go right through. But it, but it goes in order because this for loop forces it to go 0, 1, 2. And which one is it actually signaling? It's signaling 0, 1, and then 2 based on that. Yeah. And all, remember, this program, there is actually very little actual communication between the threads. I mean, it's really only the, the, and the uh, customer is just waiting for the signal. And then that signal comes out of nowhere and it moves on. You know, it doesn't know what place, it, it knows what place in line it is, but it doesn't really care at that point. It's just going, I'm just waiting. 
And then it gets a signal that goes, oh, I'm done. I can leave the store. So yeah, good, good question on that. Okay. Could we have handled the cashier, customer and cashier, if we handled the clerk's manager without the array? Not really, right? The problem is that we needed to do this in order, so we need to have enough semaphores for each one to wait in their place. Otherwise, they would be, if there was one semaphore, it would be, uh, there would be fighting going on when that signal came through, and the person who came in last in line could all of a sudden be jumping up in, in front, and that wouldn't be so good. We wouldn't like that at all. Kind of like that one where a line at a grocery store ends up, somebody opens it up and the person in the back of the line goes straight to the other cashier and you're, everybody else is like, well, it's not the right order. Chaos. So that's that. All right, any other questions on what the cashier's doing? Okay, so um, we have, so yeah, we made, uh, we need to do that. The main function, we finally made it to the main function here. So the main function uh, sets things up and let's see how it actually sets things up, okay? Uh, it sets up the customers, the manager, and the cashier. Remember, it does not do anything with the clerks because the clerks happen in the customer. The customer somehow magically creates a clerk thread. Okay, that's how, that's how uh, that one works. Okay. So the customers, uh, the total cones order, this is just for logging basically, uh, it sets up here. Um, and then the customers, we know how many customers are going to come in because we're writing this program. Maybe that could be some other random number, but that's the, that's, we did it as a constant. Okay. For each customer, what do we do? We get however many cones they want. That's where we determine how many cones each customer wants. And then uh, we set up a thread for each customer with the uh, customer ID, basically, and with the number of cones they want. And that's how each customer knows to go and get so many uh, cone, uh, clerks, num one for each cone, and then it passes on its own ID to the, to the uh, clerks and to the uh, cashier. And then uh, we actually just keep track of the total cones ordered because we want to report on that. Okay. We're going to have to join these at some point because they're all threads and they need to, when they end, we need to join them. We'll get there. Okay. Then we need one thread for the manager and one thread for the cashier, and we don't need to tell them anything uh, at this point. Well, we need to tell the manager uh, the total number of cones ordered. Um, the cashier will use the global constant to tell how many uh, customers there are, so it doesn't need to be passed in. Probably should have been in terms of a encapsulation question. Cashier gets joined for the manager. Uh, I don't think it matters. Okay. Yeah, I don't think. I think these are irrelevant because they're both ending and they're ending, and they're not coordinating, and they don't really uh, need to worry about it. Yeah. Yep. The max number of clerks uh, is the total clerk total cones ordered. Yes. Yeah. That's because we know that each clerk only makes one cone, and and now no, well, that's not true. Each clerk could make infinite number of cones, but it only makes one good cone. <laughs> it only makes one past inspection cone. So, question. Is it possible that the clerk signals before the manager responds? Is it possible that the clerk signals before the manager responds? Sure. So nothing happens then? Nothing happens then because nobody's, uh, that, all that's happening when you signal. Remember, this is not the same as signaling in a process. This is just updating that semaphore. And so the semaphore is going to get updated no matter what. Who cares if there's a, a, a manager thread yet? Once the manager thread gets ready and checks that signal, does a wait on that signal, it will move right on. Yeah, good, quite, very good question. Like this, this is not signaling in the same sense. It's too bad it's called signal in some sense because it's not really the same like I'm signaling. You're signaling the semaphore and then somebody else might be waiting on that semaphore. And so that's where that abstract signaling part comes in. So, good question. Anybody else on this one? So then what do we do after we, so, oh, now, here's the most interesting part here, and I already mentioned this a little bit. The manager, so the customers are just all spinning up and going about their business. They're creating clerks and so forth. The manager and the cashier, the first thing they are likely to do is just wait. 
but they are already running and ready to go, and they're just waiting for that one signal to happen, and through the condition variable any, and when that happens, boom, they go and they start inspecting. You don't have to spin up a thread, and spinning up a thread takes a little time. This is a good way. This is going to set us up for that thread pool stuff we talk about. We'll talk about uh, as uh, in two assignments from now. You will, we'll get to there as we go. And thread pools are uh, a good way to make it so that you reduce the lag that comes with creating a thread. There is some. Okay, then what do we do? We join all of the customers, then we join the clerk, and we join the uh, manager, and I don't believe that matters what order those happen in, because we're just waiting for them all to end. And that will mean that we don't end our program until that finishes. All right, there's a lot of code to look through. Hopefully we did it in pieces so that you got the feeling for whichever, what they all did, right? And it was much better than me typing it all live. That would have been a nightmare. Okay. Uh, any questions on the code so far? Okay, what are the takeaways from this? There's a lot going on here, right? We made a big kind of, big model. Not even that big, really, but it's a big enough model that there's lots of moving parts. Uh, managing all the threads, waiting, uh, you do have to plan this out, okay? This is not something you can just throw together and go, oh, now I need some, I gotta, you gotta sit there and plan, trust me, Julie Zelensky, when she created this, must have spent some time going, okay, what do I really need here? I want all these things to happen, I need some managers, oh, they're gonna need a semaphore, and there's gonna be another semaphore for the clerk, and oh, I need two, and whatever. It's not like she just started writing code. She certainly planned this out to, the, to uh, some extent, okay? Although I guess I know Julie enough to know she probably just did start it, but she's good enough to do that. Um, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so anyway, you do need to plan these things out. Okay? Uh, this is not the only way to do it, right? You could modify this model in a zillion different ways. You could make it so that the clerk, the the uh, clerks, there's multiple clerks that are already spun up, and then you get one at a time. That'd be a thread pool sort of thing, where a clerk once they make a good ice cream goes back in the pool and gets another one. Maybe you'd want a semaphore some number of permits with the number of clerks that can do it at a time or something. Who knows? Uh, but you would, you would uh, do that. Uh, we could, if we had more than one manager, we've already talked about the details of that, that's gonna not involve, oh, more structs or different structs or some of course. And then uh, could you create multiple clerks in main? You could have done them in main and then spun them up and that would have worked too. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, so I keep throwing around this thread pool thing. A thread pool is basically a number of threads that are all waiting to do a job. It's exactly like the farm, where you have all those Python processes that are still running on myth machines around the world. Um, you've got all those processes that are uh, all ready to go, waiting for something to do, and then boom, they do them. You don't need to start anything else up. You will see that in two assignments. You'll actually build a thread pool um, and see how it works. But it's not, it's not really that complicated. You have a whole bunch of threads, and then you say, go, but just do a wait, and then I'll eventually signal you. That's really all there is to it. All right, and then, um, yeah, that's the thread pool. Uh, waiting around, uh, we want to avoid spinning up a thread, taking the time to do that if we can, but for this program, we did it for the clerks, or we didn't do it for the clerks, we did it for the manager and the cashier. Okay. All right, so that is the program. Let me actually show it to you in action. Let's go find a terminal here. Oops. Uh, skip this version, need to go back to the cursor, skip this version, hang on, there we go, okay. Uh, all right, so we need to, let's see, are we in myth? Yes, we are. Uh, we need to go to 110 and spring live lecture thread CPP. Okay, in here I've already created the ice cream parlor, let's see it go, boom. Now, this is gonna go on. Right? And it goes on and on and on and on. And if we kind of go up and see what's going on here, clerk starts to make ice cream cone zero for customer number seven. Manager is presented with an ice cream cone. Clerk just spent 0.287 seconds making an ice cream cone, right, et cetera, et cetera. And it keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And da 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 da. -da. And you can kind of see eventually it's going to keep going. <laughs> I don't know how many. There it is. Okay. So at the end here, what happens? Well, the, uh, it says the manager is presented with an ice cream cone. Manager spent some time. And then there, the manager's done. Manager inspected a total of 333 ice cream cones before approving a total of 27. <laughs> Terrible clerks, it turns out, right? Wasting a whole bunch of ice cream. 90% of the ice cream is wasted, not good. Um, not gonna be in business very long. And then the manager leaves. 
right? And then the customer, the last customer here, takes up position, let's see, 14 at the counter. Why would that happen? Why would we have customer 10 take? I don't know. I'd have to look into that. Why it's not position 10. I'll have to look that up. I'll have to see. Um, oh, I know why. Because, because 12, 11, 5, whatever, they all happened before. Turns out that it took the most time to make customer 10s which is not the order customer 10 gets in line. The order cu customer 10 was the 14th, the final customer to get their cones made is what happened there, okay? And then the cashier has already rung everybody up. It took less time to ring them up. Uh, and then the cashier goes home. Yep. Close. The question was technically the cashier, the manager thread ends before the cashier. The manager thread is joined after the cashier thread. So uh, if you want to think about it, the cashier is like has to wait at the door before leaving. Yes. I mean, the, although the thread is actually gone, but all the cleanup for the thread has not happened yet. Let's say the cashier, the, the manager left their coffee cup on the table and somebody has to go clean it up, right? That, that's still there, but the manager's long gone. It's all done. Okay. All right. Feel free to look at this code, modify it, check it out, try to make some other semaphore changes, see what happens. Um, this is not a bad problem for a final exam. Like if you want, if if if, if this is the, this is the kind of now coming up with all like making it making it work is, is the hard part. Like for like designing the problem so it's unambiguous. But uh, this is a pretty good problem. So I would really try to understand this. If and go back to the slides, look at the code, run the code and uh, you may see something similar on the final exam. We'll see you guys Thursday, or Friday in lab, or whenever. <laughs>